All right, this is Pastor Luke. He is our senior high pastor, believe it or not. He's the one with the wild hair. It's not people People that... ask me how much product I put in, but it's just prayer that I put I into think, it. I think you need a little more product in it is what I think. Prayer over product. Yes. Right, Pastor? You put a lot of prayer in yours, my friend. We... <laughs> I'm going to be fired for that. You know, what, you know what? Pastor Luke is trying the opposite of Pastor Weaver's hairstyle. You know, like none on top and all around the sides. And we, we got, got a good thing going. Short on the sides and all on the top here. <laughs> Make a good team. Would you give Pastor Luke uh, uh, just a warm welcome as he comes and bring the word to us this morning? Yes. It's good to be with you this morning. I, uh, I had the 8 o'clock service repeat a couple things and... Uh, they did really well. They were really loud. And I said, man, you're giving the 1030 service a run for their money. So you guys better bring it this morning uh, or else the, the 8 o'clock uh, is going to beat you out. And that's, that's not good. So we don't like that. But we're continuing a series, I Am Who You Say I Am. And I'm honored to share on salt and light this morning. Would you turn to your neighbor, say salt. salt. Turn to your neighbor, say light. light. Okay, you guys are going to be just fine this morning. But... Um, we're starting in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, it's uh, one of Jesus' most famous uh, scriptures and, and sermons and teachings, uh, Sermon on the Mount. And uh, starting in verse 13, speaking to us even today, saying, You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? I'll be, it will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everybody in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Let's pray. God, we just thank you this morning. Uh, and I thank you that you want to speak to us anew. You're going to refresh us. You're going to fill us with your Holy Spirit. I thank you for anyone in this place that is is struggling in any sort of way, I thank you, God, that you, um, you are exactly um, what we need. And I pray that you would just move through me. I get out of the way uh, to let you move. And we pray all these things in your name. And everybody said, amen. amen. So I'm just going to talk through salt and light this morning a little bit about why we called, why does he, why does he call us salt and light? Why, uh, what makes us salt and light and how to be salt and light every day? single day. And so, um, like I said, this is a very important passage of Scripture because it, it breaks down and comes down to the very identity of who we are as Christians. We are salt and light. And it's a powerful Scripture to me because it says that salt can lose its saltiness and uh, light can be hidden. And so it's so important for us. Uh, and this teaching, God has been working on me uh, and stretching me with this um, and I, I just, I'm just firmly believing that the Holy Spirit's going to move uh, this morning and, and kind of teach us and challenge us in a new way. And so, uh, but why, why a salt and light metaphor for us? Um, light, when entered into a dark room, it dispels darkness. It changes its surroundings. Salt, uh, in that time frame in the Bible, there's no refrigerators, uh, obviously. And so they needed salt to put on uh, raw meat to keep it from decaying. It would make meat last longer. It also, adding salt to things in the Midwest, hello, uh, helps us with a little flavor and maybe a lot of flavor, right? And so it, it changes its surroundings, light and salt. They're, they're meant to go into somewhere and change. And, and not just change, but influence. And so we know that salt and light are meant to be influencers. They influence everything around them, everything that they touch is influenced by them. They change their surroundings and their surroundings don't change them. And so this is why it's a purpose of us as Christians to be called salt and light and to be salt and light is because our purpose is to change our surroundings. Our purpose is to influence the surroundings around us, influence our neighbors, influence our job places, our schools, our, our, our restaurants that we go to eat, any place that we go into like light dispels darkness and salt. Just it, we're called to make things better and make things brighter, right? That's what we're called to do. Uh, and, and, and so we influence. 
Also in, in verse 14, that passage, Jesus says, a light for all to see. And we know that in this culture, in this time period, in our great nation, Christians, evangelical Christians, are under scrutiny. We are being looked at and we are being seen because we are light. And light, its job is to reveal. It shows, we can see. And so we are in a time period where we as Christians are under scrutiny, under attack, and people are seeing our lives. And we better be living the right way. People are watching us, watching our actions and our deeds. Let me challenge you with this this morning, that you may be the only Jesus that somebody ever meets. You may be the only Bible that somebody ever reads. Does your life, does my life line up with God's word? Does it line up with who Jesus actually is and he claims to be? Does my life, when I go into that restaurant, when I go into my workplace, to school, when somebody cuts me off in the parking lot? Hello. Some people need to run to Jesus this morning right now, open the altars. Just kidding, I'll be there first, but. We change, we make things better and brighter and people better and brighter. Think about it this way. Every conversation that we have should be, uh, should be left better off. That person should be left better off than we first started talking to them. Every time you have a conversation, that person shouldn't leave going, wow, you know, Pastor Luke, he's such a good guy. They should be leaving going, man, his God that he serves must be pretty great. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and even if I preach a sermon, my goal is not for, man, oh, your sermon, your sermon was so great. I love that encouragement. But my, my goal is that you would leave here saying, man, God is so good. I want, I want our interactions as the church, as salt and light, everyone we come in contact with, they're leaving it going, wow, my day is better and brighter because I just talked to that person. There's something going on that I want a part of, right? That's what we do, we change our surroundings. Even in the Old Testament, I was just sparked with this when reading this story of, of, of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot. And uh, so Lot is placed in Sodom and Gomorrah and uh, he's a follower of God. And Sodom and Gomorrah, even to our culture, is known as just pure evil. We, we use those phrases as just to, to recognize the greatest kind of evil. And so he's in this horrible, dark place and he's the only little light showing and, and, and God's gonna destroy it and he tries to vouch for the city and then angels come and long story short, they, they're running away pretty much with the angels and God has saved his family, Lot's family and, and, and he proclaims, don't look back, just keep going forward, don't look back and his wife, Lot's wife, turns back and looks and I, I find it very interesting that she is turned immediately into a pillar of salt. And my perspective on that is, I just thought in my spirit, man, I bet God was just giving Lot a little bit of a exclamation point and a little bit of a challenge to say, hey, you were supposed to be salt and light in that dark place and you weren't. And maybe his wife wasn't feeling like she didn't want to go. She was looking back going, that's all, I need all that. That's, I'm a part of that. And so boom, God's saying, you need to be salt. You need to change and influence your surroundings, not the opposite. Um, so what makes salt and light effective with their surroundings? Well, there's two things this morning. The first one is purity. Turn to your neighbor and say purity. purity. Come on, 1030. <laughs> That's good. Purity. Salt has to be pure in order for it to keep things from decaying. The less pure the salt is, the worse it works. Light is pure. We know that light and darkness don't mix down to a very basic fundamental uh, laws of, of our world. It doesn't work that way. Light is pure. It's piercing. Salt is pure. And, and they don't mix. Light and darkness don't mix. And we know that physically, but also spiritually. We know that light and darkness cannot dwell in the same place spiritually. We cannot have one foot in darkness and one foot in light. Uh, it says in the New Testament that God, that makes God sick. It makes him sick enough that he'll vomit that out of his mouth. And I find it interesting that he doesn't say he'll vomit the sinner out of his mouth, but he'll vomit someone and who's half mix, and half. And we know that. Someone who's not fully pure to do the job that they're supposed to do. And if we are not fully pure, we cannot truly be salt or light. 
Because if we're not pure, we're not going to have any influence. If we look like the world, how do we change the world? The world changes us. So we need to be pure. We need to be pure in following God's commands and his truth uh, uh, every single day. If we want to make the world better, uh, we can't be like the world. We can't be like the world. We can't be posting the same stuff, using the same arguments, drinking, looking like. What, what, we can't look like that. We cannot look like the world and expect to change it and have an impact and influence on it. And a major lie that Satan loves to put in our lives is he loves to say, well, in order for you to be truly pure and survive in this life, you gotta hide. You gotta just completely remove yourself, get in that new hope little Christian bubble, don't let anyone in, don't ever go out. Just do you, hold hands with the Christian next to you and, and uh, we'll get to heaven together. And everyone else, well, I'm sorry about that. You know, I'm sorry about the rest of the world. But Christianity isn't just surviving to heaven. That's not what our purpose is. Our purpose is salt and light. And, and I'll read a passage in just a second where Jesus explains that he was sent into this dark world as light and he's sending us into the dark world as light. And so we're not supposed to be just kind of removed in this little bubble, um, just surviving. Um, because the second thing other than purity that makes salt and light effective is proximity. Proximity. Think of that. Salt needs to be on meat to keep it from decaying. Salt is placed on something to make it better. Light comes into darkness, and that's when it shines the brightest. That's when it has the most impact, influence, and changes the most. Proximity is so important. We're not called in this life to just be removed and say, I'm not going to cross paths with anyone that has darkness in their life because I don't want to be filled with darkness. No, am I saying you could go anywhere and do whatever you want as long as you're a Christian, you're filled with light? No, that's not what I'm saying. We need to have purity before we have proximity. That's how you change the world. If you have proximity before you're pure, the world changes you. You need to have both hand in hand, purity and proximity. That's what we have as effective. And I have a little illustration this morning. To, to this, I got this light here. And as if you think about our, our little Christian bubble uh, of new hope, God's called me to be the light and I'm just going to stick here because I don't want darkness to overtake me. So I'm going to shine my light in here. And oh, that's pretty cool. That's, that's pretty bright. I mean, that's nice. Really, really shines the stage really well. I can see my shoes. Uh, but that's not our purpose. Why don't you go and hit that for me, Stan? Um, this is what it's meant to be. How does that look? Sorry to blind you this morning. Um, this is what it's supposed to look like. My purpose and my job is I shine my light brightest in the darkest surroundings. And the light, as it, as it pierces through this room, it changes it. It influences what's going on. You can go ahead and turn that back on for me. And that's what our purpose is. That's what we're called to do. We're called to be pure and we're, pro we're called to have proximity. We're supposed to be sent into the world. I love this Jesus He's just about to get arrested, and he's, and he's praying. He's praying for his, his disciples, and praying, I believe, specifically for us today. Uh, and, and he says in John 17, 14, I have given them your word. The world hates them because they do not belong to the world. We don't belong to the world, just as I don't belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, listen to this, I am sending them into the world. I am sending them to stay in new hope and never go and interact with anyone else that's not a Christian. It's not what that says. I am sending them into the world to be light. And I give myself, I love this, as a, I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. Jesus is literally saying, I'm about to die, G I'm about to die, God. I'm giving myself as a sacrifice so they can be pure and then I'm gonna send them into proximity of darkness. It says it right there. So that lie that Satan says, I just have to pull back and stay away and it's not true. We're being sent into the world. Go and make disciples of all nations. Um, Jesus, this is where the phrase comes, I am in the world, but I'm not of it. 
I don't belong to the world, but I'm sent to it to influence, to change it. See, there's, it's one thing to be located in an environment, and it's another thing to draw from that environment. How many of you are Cyclone fans in the place? Raise your hand, Cyclones. How many of you guys are Hawkeye fans in the place? Okay. Okay. Hold on, here's the kicker. How many of you guys are Gopher fans? Yeah! That's my people! Come on, Josh! Yes! Everyone else, we are light to the darkness of you. Praise <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. But if I am a Cyclone fan and I go to Kinnick, hello, that, uh, it's kind of dark for me, isn't it? I know sports fans, I know football fans, right? If I'm a cyclone in enemy territory or vice versa, for us it's like the, the dirty Packers come up and play the God's chosen, frozen, the Vikings. Race. Skull, where's Jim? Skull, baby. Um, there's a hostility there, but I can still be a cyclone fan sitting in Kinnick and change my surrounding. Why can't I do that in the world? I'm not gonna leave Kinnick going, well, I'm a Hawkeye fan now. That's, that's blasphemy. That's, that's the worst kind of betrayal, all right? God's calling us into the world and I can go and be in an envir environment and not draw from that environment and not be influenced. I go into an environment to change it, to influence it. Think of a thermometer versus a thermostat. I truly believe, and, and this has plagued me sometimes as well, that I have a uh, thermometer mentality. What do I mean by that? That I love to, a thermometer will judge the temperature of its surroundings, right? A thermostat changes it. And I have a thermometer mentality sometimes where I'm judging the world instead of changing it. And we need to have a thermostat mentality that God is sending us. I'm changing. I'm setting the temperature. I'm not going to sit back and judge the world. Wow, they're, they're at this level. Let me tell you this. The world is no worse off than it was in Bible times. We just see it more because of social media. It's not worse off. Sodom and Gomorrah was the evilest of places, and I haven't found a city like Sodom and Gomorrah yet. Okay? It's not worse off, so we can't be stuck just hating the world for being the world or hating people for struggling. That's not the way it works. We need to be a thermostat saying, I'm gonna go into that and I'm gonna bring light. I'm gonna bring, make it brighter. I'm gonna bring salt. I'm gonna make it better. Uh, keep people from decaying uh, and, and stop judging culture and start changing it. Um, and so uh, th Jesus ultimately is the greatest example, obviously, because he came from a place of pure light into darkness to people that didn't want him. While we were still sinners, he came to die for us and died for me to save us. Think about this, the, if you break down darkness, it's actually not even an object. Darkness is simply the lack of an object. Darkness is the absence of light. That's it. And so when I, when we, took all the lights down in here and there was darkness all and I turned on the light or we turned the lights back on? Did all of us have to get up and shovel out the darkness before we added light to it? No, the, the light comes in and expels darkness. And so we need to start seeing people for, hey, what if, what if God's light just filled their life? What impact would they have to their surroundings? What if that person, my neighbor who, man, drives on my lawn, Pastor Zach, <laughs> that might not be the best person. What if God's light just filled that person instead of me just judging for them messing up? What if I started seeing people for their, what they can be instead of where they're at? Because God saw, God saw us for our potential, not for where we were at while we were still sinners. That will change your perspective of anyone, anyone you're talking to in the moment, saying, what if that person just got a dose of Jesus. Could I be that for them? Could I bring that to them? How would that look differently in your everyday life? Um, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, but people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's spirit. 
it all sounds foolish to them and they can't understand it. For those who are spiritual can understand what the spirit means. Darkness, when you're walking in it, it blinds you. These people are just blind. They're blind and yes, they may be doing evil things, but I'm thankful that God loves us and he died for me when I was walking around in darkness. But Pastor Luke, that's not fair. They don't deserve to be treated that way. They're just hating on me. They're hating on God. They're hating this. They're doing that open rebellion, open this. They don't deserve that. They treat people horrible. I'm just gonna remove myself and only God can judge. So I'm thankful for a God that is fully just and he is fully love at the same time. There will be a day where we will all have to stand before God. There'll be a day when the judge, our righteous judge, will judge our lives. But I'm thankful that he doesn't execute that judgment every day. I woke up this morning and the verse that came up on my phone, literally right when I woke up was, he has his, his new mercies every morning. Amen for new mercies every morning. That me, I can wake up a broken person and God has redeemed me from a dark place. And I'm not perfect, but I have new mercy every morning and he's not judging me, bringing down execution every day. So neither should we, neither should we. We should not be judging or trying to execute judgment. Psalm 103, my favorite chapter, starting verse eight. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not, cons he will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. Listen to this. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins uh, as far as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. One of the things that people say the most about when, uh, and this was a huge Barna, um, the Barna group interview thing, um, that they interviewed a ton of non-Christians. Well, why don't you go to church? You know, would you ever go to church? And the main response was that people are very judgmental and hypocritical. And the second one was, I'm, I'm just not, I don't think I'm good enough for God. I don't think I'm good enough. How heartbreaking is that? And, I, and you guys are a great example of being the hands and feet of Jesus, and I'm thankful for a church that just exemplifies that. But we need a constant reminder, not to judge, but to love. Not to judge, but to love. To be salt and light. And I have told some people, and I'm not perfect in all my responses, but I've told some people sometimes, well, I can't go to church, I'm not, I'm not good enough. Well, I've, all I can say is, I just made it to this hospital a little bit earlier than you did. That's it, right? I was just saved a little bit before you can. I'm no better off uh, than you were. Um, the gospel is not behavior modification, it is heart transformation. And that's why Jesus came. We, so many times as Christians, will judge the world and judge their actions and say, man, they need to shape up their behavior. Behavior, behavior, behavior. But you don't change behavior unless you change heart first. And God came to transform us from the inside out and then therefore because the light removes darkness, then what happens after that? Behavior starts to change. And God cares about our heart. Um, so how do we do this every single day? How do I be salt and light to the people that are so hard to do that for? Um, this is how you do it. Grace and truth. Turn to your neighbor say grace. Turn your neighbor, say truth. truth. We need to have a perfect balance between grace and truth. If I am talking to someone with only truth mindset, it might sound a little bit like this. Uh, man, I know I'm a sinner, but my dirt pile's not as big as that. Or at least I'm not doing that sin. Maybe I lie a little bit, but I'm not doing that. Or I'm hateful because of their sin. I look down, I'm better off, I'm better than. Um, I'm legalistic, I'm condemning. Uh, the whole world, they're going straight to hell. I mean, no saving them now. 
That's God's truth. It may sound like this, I'm right and you're wrong. Technically, we are right, but we're not helpful. And uh, that's not being light, that's throwing shade. And uh, God never called us to be right, he called us to be effective. And salt and light is effective. And even though, um, and Pastor Kerry just told me this and it fits so perfectly, we're, we're not called to be right, we're called to be light. And uh, even though we may be right in God's truth, that's saying, hey, if you do that and you don't serve Jesus, he's the way, the truth, and life, you're gonna go straight to hell. Even though we may be right in saying that, uh, it's not helpful and so therefore it's hurting them even though we're right, we're actually wrong in our rightness because it's not helping anybody. Nobody wants to hear you talk when you're that way. And uh, that's only truth. That's only truth speaking. But on the other opposite side of the spectrum, which is also not good, is all grace. All grace, everything. Uh, Let's just let everyone do whatever they want because we love, because Jesus loved us. And so uh, he forgave me, so he'll forgive them. And we'll just uh, accept everything. And you know what? A couple of the verses in the Bible, that's, that's pretty harsh. It's pretty condemning. So I'm going to just skip over that one when I'm talking to people because God calls me to love. So uh, I'm going to give grace to everybody and nothing matters. Um, that side isn't right either. That's not effective and that's not helping anyone either. Um, like I said, God with one foot in, that, that all grace turns you into looking more like the world. Well, I gotta be, I gotta be um, effective, so I gotta kinda look like a little bit of the world so I can relate. That's not true. And God will vomit that out. No light and darkness can mix. And uh, that's just sugarcoating the gospel, really. And so we're either throwing shade, all truth, or sugarcoating. We're called to be salt and light, not sugar and shade. And uh, we need to be grace and truth, a little bit of both. Full both, 100% grace, 100% truth. Chris Hodges puts it perfectly. Truth without grace is mean, and grace without truth is meaningless. Truth and grace together, medicine. That's the healing, That's that's where salt and light become effective, fully truth standing by God's word, fully grace. John 14, one, the word became flesh and his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, listen to this, full of grace and truth. Jesus was the greatest example, being full of grace and truth. He wasn't 75% truth, 25% grace, and oh, that person needs a little bit more more grace and a little less truth. No, full of grace, full of truth. He showed us the correct balance, why? Because he was total perfection, total righteousness, but he was right in the mix of prostitutes, tax collectors, lepers, sinners, and they were at his feet. He never compromised who he was or what he believed, but at the same time, they felt loved. Do we do that? Can we do that? See, God's truth, the truth is God's standard. God's word is truth, that's our standard. But God's grace is his favor. He favors us when we're unfavorable. He saved us while we were still sinners. That's what grace is, and we need to have both. And uh, get this, without truth, we we become corrupt. If we do not have Bible-believing truth of God's word, everything in the Bible is true to God's word, then we become corrupt, just like the world. Without truth, we become worldly. Without grace, we become condemned, condemned, excuse me. And without grace, we become judgmental. See, we'll ne- you'll never have to forgive somebody more than Jesus forgave you. We never will. Jesus went the ultimate sacrifice. And uh, we can be so good at at recognizing everybody else's sin and how they're so worldly, but we miss our own. We're, we're not aware of our own, you know, and how we're struggling. 
See, grace invites us to be free and the truth sets us free. I'm gonna say that again. Grace invites us to be free and truth sets us free. You'll never get anyone to step a foot in church without grace, but they won't be set free without truth. There's a perfect balance, perfect and delicate balance. John 13, 34, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another, Ephesians 4, 15. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. We become more like his disciples when we love one another, but we become more like Christ when we speak truth in love. That's what he's calling us to do as salt and light. You can only be salt and light if you're full of grace and truth. That's how we are effective in this world today, in this culture, that people, as every, all eyes are on us, full of grace, full of truth. Um, worship team, you could come at this time. Jesus gives us the perfect example in John chapter 8, verse 1. He says, Jesus, uh, it says, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. My question when I read this is, uh, why were the, the, the teachers of the law and Pharisees able to catch her in the act of adultery? It's hypocrisy from the start. It's judgmental from the start. I'm aware of her sin, but not of my own. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? That is the most important question that a Christian will have asked them in this life today. You will be asked that constantly, politics, sin, hot topics, immigration, uh, the Bible, controversial things. What do you say? What do you say? The whole world is looking at us. What will we say? And Jesus, being full of grace, full of truth, gives us a perfect example of how to answer that question that applies to everyday life and how to truly be salt and light. See, if he were to go only truth with his answer, he would say, yeah, kill her, stone her. That's what the law of Moses says, uh, so do it. She sinned. But on the opposite side of the spectrum, if he would have only said grace, then it was, it's fine, don't worry about it. Everyone messes up. She can, she's, just, she's just doing her thing. She's at her spot. I'm not going to judge her for her sin because we all have sin. Perfect balance. They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. Doesn't that sound like culture today? Trying to trap. But Jesus stooped down and he doodled in the dust. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and he said, All right, let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and started to doodle in the dust. When the accusers had heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle with this woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? I, I, this is just my perspective and we won't truly know until we get to heaven and get to ask Jesus what he was actually writing in the sand. But I love how it says it, it, it starts with the oldest that left. I truly believe that Jesus was maybe writing down a name of their mistresses, maybe writing down a sin and giving them time to think about it. Wow, I, I am full of sin. Who am I to throw this thing? Who am I to condemn? Jesus says, or she said, no, Lord, nobody condemns me. Jesus says, neither do I go and sin no more. That is perfect grace and truth. He says, I'm not condemning you. I'm giving you grace. Then he goes full truth and saying, but don't sin anymore. It's not good for you. It'll lead you straight to death. There's something better than that. You don't have to live in that and walk in that. Grace, truth, salt, and light. That's how we be effective. Satan will make you think, you got to choose in between those. Because some people just need full truth. You just need to lay the hammer down. Or, man, that person, like, don't go too much truth because they'll never step to foot in church again. Just, just kind of look the other way and 
full of grace and truth. I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. That's how salt and light are effective. That's how they go into the world and change and influence. And you may be thinking, well, okay, now pressure's on me. The world's looking at me because I'm a light. I'm a city on a hill. I'm an influencer trying not to be influenced, but I'm still broken. How, how do I do, how do I walk in grace and truth? That sounds impossible. There's no way. There's no way I can do that with that person. And we all know that one person that comes to our mind. But here's the most beautiful thing about being salt and light. Uh, I just have a pizza hiding under here. Just kidding. I ate it during service. Um, if you order a pizza to your house, pizza man shows up, knocks on the door, and you open the door and everything's normal. You have to pay the guy, and all of a sudden you look up, and this brother is, uh, this dude's holding the pizza in his hand without a box. And the cheese and the pepperonis are going crazy, going down his sleeve and his hairy, sweaty arm. And you're like, where the heck has that hand been? I'm about to eat that pizza. Uh, and your second thought is, where's the box? It's supposed to come in a box. Uh, I was expecting my, the product I'm buying to come in a box, to come in a vessel. It's supposed to come in one of these. The thing is, when we pay for a pizza, you're not paying for the box, you're paying for the pizza. You're paying for what's in the box. This box is only 39 cents. I got it for free from Papa John's. I walked in there, the guy was like, why are you asking for one box? And I was like, to be honest, I'm actually preaching with it. You should have seen the face that he gave me. <laughs> Garbage church? Uh, funny. But this thing is worth almost nothing. But what gives it value is what goes in the box what goes in the box. And Jesus is saying this morning, hey, you know what? I give you value. What goes in you gives you value. You may not be good enough, you may not be equipped enough, but my light in you is what the light shines on the world. And he's saying this morning, would you be my vessel? All I need you to be is clean, pure, and I need you to take it to someone. Proximity. Just do that for me, be pure, and have proximity to someone who needs the light. And I'll be the most valuable thing that you could ever give them. I'll do the work. The pressure's not on you. I died for them. We shine and he saves, amen? That's what we do. That's the most important thing. Just be clean, be pure, go out into the world. Let God's light shine through you. This morning, would you stand with me all in this place? You might be here this morning and thinking to yourself, well, I can't be salt and light because I still am full of darkness. I've never truly accepted God in my heart. I've never fully given my life to Him and my life is consumed with darkness. I need His light. I want to have the value of Him in my life and, and, and for Him to change everything. I wanna be an influencer. Maybe some of you in this place are saying, man, I, I love Jesus, I serve him, but I cannot stop being influenced by my surroundings. Or maybe I have a thermometer mentality. Of, I'm, just, I'm just so quick to judge and it causes me to distance myself and I'm not influencing anymore. I'm just separating. Full of grace and truth. We want, we're called to be effective and God wants to fill you up with the most valuable thing he can do is his Holy Spirit to give you power, to give you life, to give you freedom, to give you purpose as salt and light, to give you effectiveness. And he wants to do that this morning for you. Would you bow your heads all across this place? If you're here and you would say, Pastor Luke, I, man, I wanna give my heart to Jesus. I wanna give him my whole life. I wanna absolutely take this, have this darkness removed. I am in the absence of light and I need Jesus. I wanna rededicate myself or first time ever give my heart to him. Or maybe you're, like I just said, you're struggling one foot in, one foot out. Man, I'm being influenced by the world on weekends, but on Sundays I'm trying to be a world changer. God help me, I wanna be fully influencer or I'm, I'm too busy judging the world instead of trying to help it. Nobody looking around this between you and Jesus. 
Would you just raise your hand and say, that's me. I want to respond to that. I want to be changed by the light. Yes, there's hands up all over the place. Absolutely. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your light. Thank you, Jesus, in this place that we can worship you and we can come here and and be filled up with your light so that we can be sent out to be light. We thank you, Jesus, that, that you didn't stop and wait for us to get clean, but you saved us right where we were at. God, and I pray against the spirit of judgment. I pray against the spirit of fear that the world is going to condemn me or hate me or influence me. But I pray a spirit of power that we don't have to walk in slavery of sin, that we are set free. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. I pray that over this place, God, that we would have freedom, that we'd be influenced, that we would love. Fill us fully with grace and fully with truth and give us the wisdom how to walk in that and be true salt and light and influence and change. Thank you, Jesus.